Red Dots and Robux, Roy prepares for rapid right under your nose rutting responses. I just love it, it's brilliant fun. West Country Crows, Field Sports Nation supporter Alex Cerisi grabs a camera and gives it a go. Optical Top of the Pops, we asked you about centrefire rifle scopes, you told us, and the survey results are crystal clear. Plus, Packham gets hot under the collar about rewilding. We like to talk about rewinding. It's what grouse moor owners do to rivers. We have news, we have hunting YouTube. Welcome to Field Sports Britain. It's hot, humid, and we're in Hampshire, hoping to harmonize with hormones. The humidity is building and the Robux are hopefully feeling a little bit sexy. Amazingly, Roy always manages to deliver for us during the rut, even though the climatic conditions are not always on our side. This evening, for a change, we've hit it right. We're hoping that this will give us the chance to put Tim Pilbeam's prediction to the test, that Aimpoint's Acro will suit close-up Robux in the rut. Very quickly acquire the target. Bang. It was a few weeks ago now that we filmed Mr right. Pilbeam getting enthusiastic about Aimpoint's new red dot sight, which neatly sits side saddle on your scope. Now right, that right, baton right, has I passed so. to Roy. Uh, Bloody hard to see when you've got a dirty great camera with a floppy hair sack. <laughs> okay. We're ready to go. I don't think the row are going to play though at the minute. I don't want to play. I don't blame you. Why did you, you bring me out? out? I've come out the first time I've come out and I've come out with you and I end up getting wet in the middle of summer when we've had nothing but roasting hot days and now you've landed it's me you, in me. this. Really? Yes. Really? My yes. fault? Uh -huh. We've had a lovely time, haven't we? Yeah, we, we, oh, beautiful. Yeah, we've got I, think, I think it's the rain gods punishing us for your haircut. <laughs> oh, it's just a stick it down a bit. <laughs> <laughs> it does. It does look very good. That is. That is. That is, that is serious. That is seriously greasy. Do you want donations? Uh, huh? Donations. <laughs> donations. Okay. And then we'll do one shot. With so both optics right? shooting in the same place, Roy is good to go, and we swap soggy for sunny. The mid-afternoon heat means that the bucks are likely to be seeking cooler woodland cover, which is where we start. Here we go, here we go, here we go. Coming up the track. That was a lovely little response. Had the aim point on him as he was coming in, it would have been a very easy, simple shot to take. I was just debating whether or not to, to take him. Um, and he made the choice for me in the end, so <laughs> he was away. But uh, again, yeah, if, if it was just a case of, you know, that we, yeah, we were taking every single buck on here, um, if we were clearing out or whatever else, then it would have been a very, very simple shot. Um, but yeah, I certainly don't mind tipping my cap to that young man. Uh, well, you are your technique is very different this year. We are being far slower. We haven't, you're sitting here and it's almost like your fox calling. So we're not targeting an animal, you're just throwing it out into the wood. Yeah, what we're doing at the moment, because it's still quite hot out in the fields, and we're just sneaking into the woods and just having a few peeps. Um, and that, that does work very well sometimes. And again, it's always worth just remembering that the, the, the you know, deer can be just as lazy as us and they'll take the path of least resistance. So here you've got a, a, tr a quad track that goes down through here. And if you noticed, he came through from the wood and then followed the track straight up. So again, if they can, um, they will follow the path of least resistance and, and, and come on an easier trail. So it's, you know, when you've got tracks like that, um, and I've got the field behind us, um, you know, that, that would have been the most obvious way that he would have come, um, and he did. 
Um, all right, let's go on and see if we can find some more. I just love it, it's brilliant fun. Apart from our one response, there's not a lot going on, and the bucks are certainly not throwing themselves at us. Then, on the far edge of a field, we spot a buck browsing. He's on his way. This response illustrates just how patient you need to be when calling. Roy brings this guy in from hundreds of yards away. Just imagine if this was in woodland. His positive steps towards us would go unseen. There's every chance you'd have packed up before he gets halfway. This is exactly what can happen in the woods. They'll just slowly make their way through. Sometimes they're just compounding, but sometimes they're slow and methodical. Unfortunately, as he came across the track, he saw the car parked further up the track and then didn't like it, didn't want to come up. But, I mean, beautiful call all the way down. And again, we could have shot him, but he's still a, a relatively young animal. And he'll, be, he'll definitely improve. I mean, we got him coming from you know, about 500 metres away. Came down to within about 60 metres, um, but then just didn't want to turn to come up to us. So, um, off he went into there, but that, that was a fabulous little call. But again, you can just see why you've got to be so slow. You know, if it's if it's not absolutely cooking, and if they're not 100% on it, they'll come, but they'll just just sneak their way through. But it's always a good lesson when you see them in the open. Finally, Roy sees a buck he's happy to take. Point, but I didn't want to shoot him square in the head because he was right on us. So he spooked, let him go off to about 20 and then took the shot. Don't you love it when a plan comes together? Where he was in the crop and where I was down on the sticks, I just didn't have a neck shot. So I had the, the dot straight on him um, and could have taken the head shot. I was hoping he would just circle or just go out and stop again and he just circled and then gave me the opportunity for the next shot. Be superb, we'll go and pick him up and we'll just have a look around and just see if we can get a couple more responses before darkness befalls us. He's quite a quirky little thing. Absolutely beautiful, stunning, stunning deer. David was just inquiring, I can't believe he's not noticed that, that 
the black marking there is one of his scent glands. So he'll have those both sides. Obviously it, it's a marker to the other deer um, that they're there and you know, obviously when they're going through so they've got an idea on territories etc. I would have thought you would have seen many many scent glands over the years of playing. <laughs> but... Sadly not. Sorry? Sadly not. Sadly not, no. He's not been feeding. It's a nice clean animal. Unlike a lot of other male deer during the rutting season, Roe don't smell. Roe don't um, get as disgusting as fallow and as reds. So where they're not um, dousing themselves in their own stench by wallowing and running about or weeing up themselves, it's, uh, they, don't, they certainly don't taint themselves anywhere near like the others do. With the buck Gralex, Roy puts the rifle away and we see if we can get any more responses. Once again, we've been fortunate enough to interact with this little deer at this special time of year. And if you're producing these kinds of responses, maybe you need to be ready for close encounters of the Aimpoint kind too. For more information about the Acro, go to aimpoint.com. Thank you, Roy and Aimpoint. And I have to say that the Steventon shoot and the Farlian Wallop shoot run by Keith Gorsuch still have Availability for pheasant days this season, 250 to 400 bird days. There's a telephone number on the screen if you want to contact Keith. Now from red dots to black marks, it's David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. This is Field Sports Channel News. Chris Packham's request for a truce with shooters has angered Basque. The BBC TV presenter floated the idea in national newspapers and spelled it out in an article in Field Sports magazine, which we should stress is not our publication. Packham's refusal to accept science that shows how grouse moors play a vital role in conservation angers shooters, who say he wrote the article so he can say the shooters don't listen to him. He is stepping up his campaigning with a virtual Hen Harrier Day this weekend. He has an extremist agenda. Um, his, his truce will no doubt come with uh, conditions that will play to that agenda. Um, while he does that, shooting will continue to, uh, to do the hard work. <laughs> you know, the people who are out there today will continue to get their hands dirty, that, you know, continue to protect the countryside, continue to, to protect the wildlife. Um, and we will uh, continue to fight Chris Packham for... Uh, for everything that we that we stand for uh, and everything that we believe is is right uh, for for us for shooting and uh, for the British countryside. Hedgehog numbers may have halved since 2007, but why? Loss of hedgerows, or dare we point the finger at badgers? The GWCT wrote to the Guardian to correct an article about dwindling wildlife numbers. Director of Communications Andrew Gilruth says the decline of hedgerows was successfully halted a decade earlier through their legal protection. However, he writes that it's odd the impact of badgers which kill and eat hedgehogs is not mentioned in the article. Gilruth points out that the badger population has doubled since 1980 and farmers across the country are wondering when the animals will be blamed instead of them. Lockdown may be ending, but the demand for pets is not, with frequent reports of stolen gun dogs. This video shows a man stealing a Springer Spaniel from a kennel in Blythe in Northumberland. Owners are offering a reward for its safe return. If you know this man, please call Brad on the number in the description. Remington, America's oldest gun maker, is up for sale, but it's not cheap. If you want the company, you'll need more than half a billion US dollars. Native American tribe, the Navajo Nation's offer of $525 million didn't make the cut. There are indications a deal is close. The company has filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection, which US companies do to protect assets, customers, staff and stakeholders during restructuring or sale of a business. Antis in France have struck another fishing facility. A fishing hut burned down on the 10th of July 2020 in the northeast of the country. Authorities say the door of the building was forced open and a fire started against a wall. Comments on social media congratulate the arsonists and compare fishermen to murderers. Africa's rhinos face a new poaching threat after traditional Chinese medicine touted horn as a cure for coronavirus. According to the South China Morning Post, rhino horn is an ingredient in the ibuprofen of TCM. 
For more than 2,000 years, traditional Chinese medicine has listed rhino horns as a cure-all, recommending it in its powdered form for everything from fevers to cancer, but evidence to back up the claims is scarce. Beijing banned domestic trade and medicinal use of rhino horn in the 1990s. Hunter and campaigner Jens Ulrich Hoag has alerted antis to a scandal they seem to be ignoring. The Nordic Safari Club press officer posted a video on Facebook asking why animal rights activists are not raising a fuss about a proposed cull by South African national parks of more than 2,600 animals, including ostriches, warthogs and zebras. Tenders are available for download at Sand Park's website for anyone who's interested. Hoag thinks it's odd that activists like former actor Peter Egan, who recently compared trophy hunters to paedophiles in an angry social media post, haven't mentioned the cull plans on social media. These, these celebrities have absolutely no education, absolutely no experience in the field of nature conservation, and yet uh, they have an opinion about everything and, and and they say they have a solution, but the only solution they have is stop hunting now. A man who convinced his friend to drive into kangaroos has been sentenced. A New South Wales court sentenced Ashley Sorensen, who was in the passenger seat when the driver ran over 21 kangaroos in September 2019. The 34-year-old received a maximum sentence of 20 months prison. Sorensen and the driver Nathan Sanger, who was 18, had been drinking. The court heard that Sorensen encouraged Sanger and even grabbed the steering wheel to run into more kangaroos. Cyprus plans new fines for hunters that shoot protected species. The rules will cover 14 species of bird, including sparrows, chaffinches and golden orioles. In an effort to show that shooters are rich, anti-hunting group BirdLife Cyprus say that €200 Euro fines are too low. It's urging MPs not to pass the bird protection bill. Antis ignore the conservation work that hunters carry out on Cyprus, such as this hair release programme. Online voting on the EU-led ammunition debate has been paused. That's after the Czech Republic requested a face-to-face -face reconvening of the EU's registration, evaluation, authorisation and restriction of chemicals or REACH committee. It's responsible for preparing lead ammunition proposals across Europe. It is not now known exactly when the meeting will take place, but it might not be until 2021. Basque says further EU restrictions on lead ammunition will impact us and we will have limited lobbying power because our MEPs have already left their positions. It promises to give staff and financial support to its European hunters to fight against these unworkable proposals. Wildlife authorities in Florida have reached a milestone in their python eradication programme. 5,000 invasive Burmese pythons have now been taken from South Florida's Everglades ecosystem. Burmese pythons became established in Florida as a result of escaped or released pets. It is illegal to release non-native species into the wild and can negatively affect native wildlife. The Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission has an exotic pet amnesty program allowing owners to surrender their non-native species without a penalty. There have been reports during the summer of wild boar attacks on sheep in Scotland. Now a video has emerged from Spain's Basque country of exactly that. The boar chases off the rest of the flock before concentrating its attacks on one animal. And finally, a brave Donald Trump supporter has been putting campaign stickers on black bears. And it's thanks to Steve Kearney for this story. A North Carolina animal rights group is offering a 5,000 US dollar reward for any information after two tagged bears in Asheville were seen with Trump stickers on their tracking collars. Asheville Bears says the animals are not billboards. You are now to date with Field Sports Channel News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts. Thank you, David. And if after that you still want clarity, well, we're going to shed a bit of light on centerfire rifle scopes and the results of our centerfire rifle scope survey. Well, pop my cover. 669 of you took part in the centerfire rifle scope survey out of the massive 3,500 of you who responded to our lockdown surveys in March 2020. And you reveal that almost all of the scopes you put on your centerfire rifles come from just 16 companies. The survey also shows that you are prepared to pay for glass. The top three scope manufacturers are all at the pricey end of the market. 
But we are not just rating popularity. Here is what you told us about great scope attributes. Ease of use, waterproofing, durability, reliability, value for money, customer service if something goes wrong with your scope, and accuracy. Winner for ease of use is the Swarovski Z6i with the high-end models from Zeiss, Leupold, Nightforce and Schmittenbender all highly rated for the same. Winner of the waterproofing vote is the mid-priced Steiner Ranger series. Your favourite scope for bash it about, drop it on the floor, durability and reliability is the Nightforce NXS range, which more of you use for deer stalking than fox shooting, I was surprised to read. Another surprise is that your top choices for accuracy are not the expensive scopes from Swarovski Zeiss and Leica, but the budget Vortex Viper, just ahead of scopes from Bushnell and Burris. As for value for money, the mid-range Nikon Monarch takes it, just ahead of scopes from Leica and Minox. And the Customer Service Award goes to Steiner, again beating Minox. Those are the mini awards. In the world of scopes, nothing succeeds like success, and the big prize goes to the most popular scopes. Who has the biggest market share? Here it is, in reverse order. Third place, the Schmittenbender Classic Series. Schmittenbender has 12% of the market of Field Sports Channel viewers. Second place, the Zeiss V8 Series, slightly ahead of the Zeiss V4. Zeiss has 17% of our market. And first place, the Swarovski Z6i. Swarovski has 20% of the market of Field Sports Channel viewers. As the world goes increasingly digital, will this be the last time you see such a dazzling array of glassware? That is interesting, especially I think that you, the Field Sports Channel viewers, tend to spend less money on scopes if you compare it to the binoculars survey we did a, a few weeks ago where expensive binoculars came top. Uh, and if you want to find out uh, more about our surveys, go to the field tester pages of our website and you can find kit reviews there too. Now, we like to big up our audience, but the Field Sports Nation section of our audience, that's a whole different level. Field Sports Nation member Alex Cerisi has been watching our films for more than 10 years. Give that man a badge. Oh, he's a Field Sports Nation member. He already has one. Give that man a hat. He's a Field Sports Nation member. He got the goodie box with all that in it. And you could too if you sign up following the link in the description below. Well, I'm talking about Alex because he went off to film Crows with Matt Turley. Here's what happened. When Field Sports Nation member Alex Cerisi and his sister heard about Matt Turley's crow shooting down on the Somerset Pig Farm, they had to give it a go. Alex even offered to film it for us. It's a 4am start and Matt is setting up a strategic pattern in what he feels is the perfect spot. Just a random decoy pattern out here this morning. Um, obviously behind us we've got 12 decoys up on 8 foot poles above the trees to make them stand out from a distance. We've got the trusty FF5 flapper up on the pole there behind us. And then here on the track, we've got the 20 flop coated crow decoys from Jack Pike, just to give that a little bit more added attraction and hopefully bring them in with a lot more confidence. And obviously with the, with the decoys behind the crows sat in the trees, we just then want to give the impression of birds here feeding on the ground. So we've got a pattern here, decoys two or three foot apart, just to make it a bit more visible as they're flying in. There are a few flying over, but Matt decides the perfect pattern needs a tweak. Just going to move the decoys up. We've got feeling these crows as they're coming up now towards the decoys, they're looking straight into the high. We just want to move the decoys up 30 yards just to get them away from our attention. In our position, these crows aren't committing into the decoys enough now this morning. They're flaring off at something which we don't know what. So the only thing we can try is a different spot. The slight change of the decoys seems to do the job.
After eight hours in the hide, it's only lunchtime. Like any cameraman who's out of snacks and hasn't taken a single shot, Alex decides it's time to leave. Sister happy with her brother's generous invitation, Alex delighted with Matt's crow shooting. Thank you, Alex, and thank you, Matt, for putting on the day. Now, it is the run-up to the glorious 12th of August, and of course, BBC TV presenter and all the other aunties are trying to get Driven Grouse shooting banned. One of the attacks they're making is about flooding. They say grouse moors cause flooding. Packham will not listen. We've been off to meet grouse moor owners to explain what's really happening. This is not the view of York that draws tourists from all over the world. This is the city at a low point during flooding in recent years. And according to celebrity animal rights activist Chris Packham, gamekeepers are to blame. Packham has long accused the states of draining the moors. He repeats the claim in the media this week. To his credit, he admits he doesn't have any evidence, saying instead he will need to go and research. We can point him in the right direction. Coverhead Farm in the Yorkshire Dales. We're very lucky at Coverhead in that we've got a lovely uh, big stream or small river that starts on the farm and runs right through the middle. But it's been modified uh, over the decades and centuries by people uh, at a time when it was not seen as important. Uh, it was seen as a gutter to get water away. And once it left the farm, you didn't care where it went. The, the river, which is the cover, runs into the Ewer, which runs into the Ewes, which goes through York. So if a river up here is pushing the water off as quickly as possible, York floods. The waterway has been abused over time by bad government policies such as grips, drainage channels installed between the 1950s and 1980s as a way of creating more farmland to feed the country. So here we have an example of a moorland grip and when it was made it was a foot wide and 18 inches deep. It's now about five foot wide and four foot deep. Uh, in a dry time the peat on the edges dries and crumbles and gradually the grips go from a foot wide to as big as you like. And we're now further down the same grip where it's been blocked. That's allowed vegetation to heal over uh, forming a skin on the peat and just in front of each uh, block, grip block, you find a little pool. When we first came to the farm in the 80s, there was hardly a stone in the river that was smaller than a football, because all the small stuff was disappearing down the river every flood. Since the grips have been blocked up, the, the peaks have been a lot lower, and the force of the river has been a lot lower. That's allowed smaller rocks and gravels to stop and silt the big boulders are no longer moving and they've become concreted into the bed. They're adding roughness to the bed of the river, which, which slows the water up itself. Perhaps Packham needs to get a grip. While he bangs on about rewilding the moors, Maul is passionate about Coverhead and has spent years rewinding the river. In many places, it's been straightened to grab a bit more meadowland because when people had to, to feed their cattle, and their sheep, they were dependent on how much grass they can meadow. We've got uh, the floodplain, but the river has been pushed into the shadow uh, of the hill and it's been made straight and they've, they've built a wall to retain it and then people have meadowed the bit of ground that they've reclaimed from the river. Great for the meadow, but what it means is the river is, is short, it's straight, it's narrow, and it's lost its function. It can't, it, it, it runs too straight. So it's, it's a big problem to fix, but how we're fixing it is taking a load of the limestone blocks that have fallen off this cliff here and putting them in the river to add roughness and make the, make the river do a few little bends within the channel. And it's worked brilliantly uh, this year and there's some really nice gravel formed in there which the sea trout and the, and the trout can go and spawn in. Um. Maul isn't the only one trying to keep as much water on the moors as possible. George Windali is doing similar work in the North York moors, as we have highlighted before. Trying to control water is difficult enough, but when nature decides to destroy all your hard work, what can you do? When we had Storm Dennis, a lot of the works we did in the summer disappeared, but not all. Wood is better than stone because uh, in a hot time, 
wood uh, doesn't heat up in the same way that stone does. Uh, and this is a, a, a tree that uh, is an old ash tree that's fallen over from the cliff there and I've dragged it into the river. And before the storm it was up there, <laughs> but the, the storm's picked it up and brought it down here, but it's still doing a nice bit of uh, work in the river. Maybe half went, but half stayed. So we can build on that and we'll and carry on. So how long will it take you to slow the river down to like the, the speed that you want? To, to, to perfect it, all my life. <laughs> it's going to be, because really, by rights, that you, you want to get it so that in a flood, the water is from that bank to that bank. Because if you can get the water to leave the channel, then it's slowing down and you're storing water. Uh, and we're a, lot, we're a long way from that. I mean, this little bit here isn't too bad because the, 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 the distance from the bottom of the bed to the bank isn't that much. But in other places, you know, the river is in cut by eight feet or so. Uh, and that, that takes a lot of building up. Uh, and we're still working on the techniques to do it. Beavers might work. The farm will be doing a beaver feasibility study this summer, so stay tuned. In the meantime, you can read about James Moore's hard work in the GWCT's Moorland Conservationists publication. Click the link in the description below this video. Thank you to our news editor Ben O'Rourke for that report. Now from Yorkshire to the rest of the world of hunting and shooting on YouTube, it is Hunting YouTube. This is Hunting YouTube, which aims to show the best hunting and shooting videos that YouTube has to offer. Squirrel Hunter has a big day on what he calls Squirrel Hill. He is feeding in greys and popping them off with his brother on camera. South Somerset Ferreters has turned its attention to pigeon shooting in this video. Our old friend Jaff Jefferson is protecting the crops from the greys. Larger grey birds in this film, Holton Media in the Netherlands, shoots 18 grey legs barnacles and Egyptian geese. Jackal and Wild Boar Pest Control next in Croatia in English. It's a 20 minute piece and Servile Channel is using a 300 Winmag Zauer 404. Winchester Ammunition heads to the last frontier state for Mission Alaska Sheep Hunt. They are filming hunter Austin Manalik. Here's something you didn't know you needed to know from Pakistan. How to trap a demoiselle crane with a rope line. It's not totally clear how it works, but the results are dramatic. Scott Robinson Outdoors is one of many outfitters campaigning to keep the tar hunt in New Zealand, pitched against a government that wants to stamp it out. Here's what a tar hunt with them is like. And finally, no shooting but great suspense. You know that thing when you are harvesting the last square and you reckon a fox might pop out? This is what they have to contend with in Spain. It's a 14 strong feast of wild boar. That's it for this week. I've put all these films into a playlist for you. Click on the eye symbol top right or check this film's description. If you have a YouTube film you would like us to pop into the weekly top eight, email me the link charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv. Well, that is it for this week. If you haven't done so already, please pop over to our website, fieldsportschannel.tv. You can click to like us on Facebook and on Instagram, follow us on Twitter, subscribe to us on YouTube, pop your email address into our registered page, and we'll contact you about this show, Field Sports Britain. It's at 7 pm UK time every Wednesday. Now, other people's dogs are pretty ghastly. My dog Muffin was with me for a quarter of my life. She died aged 14 on Sunday. Here she is. <laughs>